What are some effective interventions? I'm joined by Jean Wittenberg, June Maresca, Jean Clinton, Donna Gray, and Mary Rella. Uh, Jean, I would like to start with you. What information needs to be gathered about a child who has experienced neglect? Well, how children, uh, especially little children, uh, reflect how their uh, experience has been is through their behavior. So you want to have a good knowledge of what typical development is. Uh, so is a, taught, is a little 18 month old walking? Um, um, are they developing language? So we use developmental uh, pathways as one of our big markers of how are very little children doing in terms of their development. So that's one. Secondly, um, we want to look at their, uh, their physical well-being. Um, um, uh, do they have uh, bruises? Have they been lying in one place? Do they have a flat head because they've been lying all of the time? What's the state, uh, what's the state of their mouth, um, uh, cavities, uh, and what have you? And then the third is that looking at the relational part of the, of, uh, of the development. Um, does the child engage with others? We have a drive to be social, to connect, it's how we survive. And if you have an infant uh, or a, a baby or a toddler who's not interested in another person, that has to be a red flag. That has to tell us, hmm, what is going on? Or if we see infants who are turning away instead of uh, uh, going to, um, that's one end. And then the other is, are they indiscriminate? Are they coming up to you and sitting on your lap and you don't know them at all? And so they just don't have any who is my person and who's not my person. So they're the three big areas to look for in terms of neglect, I'd say. All right, Jean, let's talk about um, interventions for a minute. What sorts of interventions are supported by evidence? Um, so that's, that's a very important question, uh, and one in which, unfortunately, we don't have enough evidence, uh, particularly for this population, which is a very complex population. There are many different kinds of people who show up in these situations. But I would think about it in terms of three kinds of interventions. So the first one is preventive. Uh, how often can we do something with a family, with parents, that will make it likely that they will not reoffend, that they will not once again neglect or abuse a child? Uh, there are a couple of, of interventions that have evidence for them. Uh, one is a, a nurse visiting program into the home. The other is a Triple P uh, program that, that's used quite uh, widely now. It has a little bit of evidence showing that there may be some preventive uh, strength in, in that. And those are the ones in which evidence has been collected. Um, the the uh, second type of program it has to do with can we help parents or caregivers with the pathology they have change so that they see the child differently. There's a lot less evidence for that and, and the biggest issue there is really that we have to protect the child. So I think probably the majority of or in one large study that Charlie Zena did down in, in Louisiana with, with this kind of family, uh, they found that they were able to help some of the parents become better parents for their children and not reoffend. But in fact, they took more of the children out of the families, out of the entire group. So it's a, it's a vital balance for judges, a vital decision for judges to make. Then the third kind of intervention to think about is what can be done for the children who have been through this. Uh, and there are some programs that, that help kids with trauma, help infants with, with trauma. Uh, but generally speaking, they're, they're complex interventions that involve supports for many of the kinds of systems that Jean talked about that we collect in when, when we're doing an assessment. We have to address each one of those specifically. And in the background is the issue of permanence. We, the, the most important things for these infants and young children is that they be put into a caregiver, a set of caregiver relationships that last because they learn over time. These things don't get turned around quickly. And if they've had a lot of negative experiences to date, it's that much harder to get it turned around and to help them develop a sense of trust in what's going on around them and in the people with them. Well, how long is too long for infants and toddlers not to have a permanent plan, Jean? 
Well, one of the things that worries me is sometimes the system can, uh, can be morphed in ways that children end up in limbo uh, for, for a very long time. Um, and, you know, I've said, and um, uh, June here as a judge also, um, that the baby's brains don't go on hold as we're waiting for the judge or the system um, uh, to, make, uh, to make decisions. So I think it's essential that decisions be made as quickly and as competently as possible, that we work into a system, that we figure out what's the information that needs to come before the judges and the lawyers so that a decision can, uh, can be made. We know from studies, uh, from Romanian orphan studies, that infants and little children who were left in the orphanage for longer than two and a half years, when they were adopted or when they went into foster care, their results in foster care were not as good as the infants who had been um, uh, in, put in foster care before. Um, uh, before two and a half. But one of the researchers always emphasizes each individual child is different. Some of the kids who were in for two and a half years had had a favorite caregiver. They had characteristics um, that, w that were somehow protective of them. So I don't think we can say how long is too long um, because we can't. Um, put a, a, a solid figure on it, but we do have to say, get this done as quickly as we possibly can, because the baby's brain does not go on hold and all the experiences are building it. June, how do you address that as a judge? Um, it is a difficult balance sometimes, because um, I think that uh, <clears throat> one has to be very sure as a judge that if you're going to make a permanent decision for a baby, um, it has to be the right decision or, or the best decision that you can possibly make. I think the concern um, as a judge is when I see an application, for example, in a child protection context that says, okay, we've apprehended this baby um, and we want six months society wardship. So we've got six months to sort this out. And that worries me um, because if you, if you want some time to do this, you can't simply say six months. That sounds like a good number. Um, because our sense of time and a baby's sense of time are miles apart. Um, and what is a blink of an eye to us who have to organize assessments and access visits, observations and so forth, is something that a baby just can't tolerate. So um, I think what we as judges need to pay very close attention to is what kinds of timelines we are prepared to allow people to work within. And we need to keep the pressure up so that people don't uh, get into a rhythm of, well, if it's a baby, we ask for six months. So June, you're saying, what I'm hearing, um, is really that uh, this developmental period is qualitatively and quantitatively different than it is for older children. Absolutely. So we need to be thinking very differently. That's that. right. Okay. So, so if I see a child uh, in, a, in a family that comes in front of me who is, say, 10 or 12 years old, um, six months in that child's life, although still, if you can think back to when you were that long, summer seemed like an eternity. Um, that long of time is still significant for them. It's way different than it is for an infant, for a two-month-old baby or a one-month-old baby. John? And I think what happens often in an agency such as the Children's Aid Society, where I work, um, as uh, Justice Moresca says, the workers think, well, we have to give six months, can, something will come together, something will happen in that time period, whereas I think it's important that we all work together to, to move it along and not see this legislation as permissive. It, it's a framework. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to take six months or to a year or even two years. And I think that as lawyers for this agency, we have to take a more proactive role in that as well in, in reminding judges and, and our social workers who instruct us as lawyers for this agency that um, it's a framework. It, it's not a, a rule that we have to follow to the letter. So. Can I, can I yes. just add something to that? It's not just the period of time, but what happens inside that period of time. So some foster homes or alternate caregivers are very good. Uh, and, and others, or when a child is moved from home to home to home, is, is much more stressful for a child. So it is time, but also the quality of experience in the time. 
All right, let's talk about interventions for a minute. Mary, is a parenting program, for instance, enough of an intervention? That's a really good question. Um, when we're looking at parenting programs, we really have to be, the, the, for, for those of us who are needing to understand information about parenting and risks that parents promote, one of the things that we have to be able to distinguish be between is, is this a skill that a parent needs to develop versus is this a caregiving behavior that a parent has that um, a, a parenting group that offers skill building may not necessarily address. I think as Mary is saying, not all parenting courses are created equal. Mm -hmm. And there may be some parenting courses are very good for some of the behavioral and common, uh, common issues that you have in parenting. But these, um, the, the, the kind of, of intervention that's required when there has been an attachment disruption, when the parent isn't reading the baby's cues, have to be very, very specific, have to be um, a very good. So the judge needs to be thinking about not just parenting course, but what do I know about the resources available in my community that I might be able to access. Uh, Dr. Wittenberg has developed a, a program um, around attachment. Um, um, we've got Circle of Security. So there are a number of, of programs that are effective. The only one that is uh, identified as preventing child abuse in high-risk situations is the one that uh, Jean has mentioned, and that's the Nurse Family Partnership, which is an intensive uh, nurse uh, visitation um, uh, visitation program. So the research is ongoing, but we can't wait for these long-term trials. So I think it's incumbent upon our child welfare agencies, our mental health, to be saying and creating the list of here are evidence-informed, evidence-based programs for these kinds of behaviors and problems. Because very often the mom or the dad never had the kind of caregiving that we are now asking them to provide for their child. So that trauma-informed, that's crucial for uh, an effective parenting program. And, and I think that uh, becomes very important for judges as well. So when, when uh, there's a suggestion that a particular intervention be offered to a parent, like a parenting course. Um, I think it's very easy sometimes for a judge to say, okay, parenting course, that's a great idea. I think we need to ask more questions than that. Okay, well, what does this parenting course involve? Who's going to be teaching it? What are some of the things that they're going to be teaching? Um, how many people are participating in it? Is this something that is going to actually address the concerns that, are, that uh, this family is, is facing? And I think that it's, um, you know, we, we sometimes uh, use our little ticky boxes too quickly, and we need to ask these really probing questions to understand whether it's going to be an intervention that's going to actually help. Just, uh, sorry, just to add to that, I think the judges have to, and we have to ask too, is the parent even going? Because you can recommend the parenting course, and a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of us do, that they should take a parenting course, and beyond not looking at whether it fits the scenario and the situation, you need to know whether the parent's going, whether the parent's participating, whether the parent is learning and acquiring skills that he or she can sustain. And I think that as um, Justice Maraska says, often it's enough to say they've gone, they have their certificate, done. But I don't think it is enough. So, so one of the things that we're talking about is not only attendance at these programs, but change in the parent. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's not only change in learning skills, but also uh, building capacity and how robust is that capacity. So we can all do things well when we're not stressed, but if we're more stressed, we sometimes give those, those things up and it becomes vital that the parent be able to keep the child in mind, even in times of stress. Uh, and, and be able to continue reading the child and understanding what the child's reactions are in, in stressful situations, I would want to see that change coming out of interventions. Then there's another point which I think is really important, and that has to do with the fact that many of these infants and toddlers have been traumatized by their parents. And, and just the appearance of the parent on the scene re-evokes all that 
all that trauma. Somehow the interventions have to get hold of that so that a child is not being re-traumatized every time there's an access visit, every time he's exposed to the parent. And it may be subtle, like some of those yes. indicators may be very, very subtle. So one of the areas that is available to all parents and one of the areas, for example, access, where we're not sending parents anywhere. They're coming to access, most of them. They're making use of that time. Generally, there is another person, another social worker available or another health, uh, mental health professional there to be helpful to the parent. And rather than sending these parents off somewhere, hoping that whatever intervention they're learning is going to have some positive impact on their parenting and or in reducing the risks, we have that area, we have that space to be able to understand it better. And it's incumbent on us to organize that time, understand how to use that access time so that we can see whether maybe initially there is that traumatizing, but what the parent learns in that time, how to attune and respond and be present with the child, helps the child move away from those trauma responses to building more security. You know, the, the other, just one other thing about uh, interventions is I, I know, especially uh, outside of the GTA, um, in jurisdictions where there aren't a lot of resources that are available, there aren't these really good um, um, interventions in terms of access and therapeutic access. Um, that's where I think as judges uh, we also need to get creative and to, if we understand what the parent needs, what the baby needs, maybe there's someone else who can provide this. Maybe there is a kin um, who is prepared to have this parent come in and work with them and really learn firsthand, hands-on, what it means to respond to a baby's cry, what it means to uh, be attuned to a baby's cue. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a government-funded program if there wasn't one around. Um, there, I think there are other ways to get to these kinds of learning environments. And those are the kinds of questions I think judges need to ask as well. And I think that's the, the, the key there, Jun. The, the, these modules are uh, increasing the awareness of what kinds of things should I be asking about. So moving from the checkbox to more reflective about what is actually going to be happening. And, you know, following uh, Justice Moresca, being creative.